Well, good morning. We've done quite a few things already, and I want to take a few minutes to examine chapter 10 of Nehemiah. That's where we are in, in the book of Nehemiah. We've progressed that far. We've been doing a series on Nehemiah called The Mission. Today, we are looking at a passage in chapter 10, which ends with the words, we will not neglect the house of our God. You know, the Bible teaches that we see God's glory in many places and many ways. One of the ways we see God's glory is in creation. We uh, see the Lord in the beauty of creation, the, uh, the diversity of creation, the, in, the, incredible, the incredible variety of things. Just think about the types of flowers that are made. There's so many different types of flowers. Think about the many different types of people there are. So many different uh, peoples all over the world. We see God's glory in his creation. The Bible also teaches us that we see his glory in his word. The general revelation is his creation. You know, some people say, I see God when I hike in the mountains. Uh, some people say they see God uh, on the golf course. They commune with him. I have to say, I mostly just see the devil when I am on the golf course. Uh, you can figure that out for yourself. But um, the other way that we see God's glory is through his word. That is a special revelation, as uh, we've been told, as Karen shared with us earlier. We see his glory in his word. Most pointedly, we see his glory in Jesus Christ. But more than that, we see the glory of God, God uniquely dwelling on earth and working through his church, which is the body of Christ. And that is the worshiping community somehow reflects God's presence, reflects his glory in a way that no other human institution, no other human agency can. I have many times experienced God's glory in him among his church. When I was newly coming to Christ, I told you last week about my experience where uh, in a very, very uh, conservative Baptist church, I knelt at the altar. They were meeting in a, in a school gym. I knelt at the altar, and as I knelt, I sensed the weight of my sin leave and the glory of God to descend upon me. Another time, shortly after that, I feel like I experienced the glory of God when I was worshiping with a large group of people who had gathered into the Washington uh, Mall, the Mall of the Washington Monument, and there was a big tent set up there by uh, an evangelistic group, uh, Christ, um, Youth for Christ and Youth with a Mission, and as there were worship services there and preaching was there, and the people of God began to worship him, and they began to worship him in spirit, and they began to worship him with their understanding. I sense the presence of the Lord. I sense God's presence in the midst of his people. There was been many, many other times, but one time when uh, Jane and I were newly married, and we were concerned uh, about the fact that she was pregnant. She was uh, over five months pregnant, close to six. We'd felt no movement at all, and we were worried about this child, what's happening. We went to a church meeting that met in a restaurant, 10 a.m. And in the meeting, they had rented that space for that Sunday morning, and uh, the preaching of the word went out, and they said, does anybody want prayer? And we wanted prayer because we were concerned about this thing. I was very concerned, and I raised my hand. And someone came and anointed me with oil. It wasn't much to it. They just anointed me with oil and moved on. And when I left that meeting, I sensed the Lord speaking to me. Where is your faith? And he was telling me, things are going to be okay. And that evening, as uh, we lay down, Jane said, oh, my goodness, feel this. And there was a, a soccer match going on inside there. There's another time in a Presbyterian church in a much more formal setting. They called people forward. I had had a very severe inflammation in my arm. I remember receiving prayer through the body of Christ, through the people of God. And receiving that prayer, I felt just the power of God, just electricity 
going up and down my arm. If you've experienced this, you know what I'm talking about. It was the power of God to heal, and it lifted that inflammation. There are other times when I went, Jane and I went with groups of students who were the church reaching out to those in need, went to uh, camps, uh, refugee camps in Croatia for Bosnian refugees who had flooded out of that country during the time of war. And these were people of Muslim background. And I remember that we prayed for those people, that they would hear from their relatives and their loved ones. They hadn't heard from them. They didn't know where they are. They didn't know if they were alive. And this was before cell phones and before internet. And there were several thousand people in the camp and there were like a handful, two, three, five telephones. There was no way to get word. And we prayed, Lord, that these folks would hear something from their relatives. And the next week, eight out of the nine or so people had heard that their relatives were okay. God works through his church, through his people. God works uniquely dwelling in them and working through them. And he works through a worshiping community. So when Nehemiah, as we've been studying, has gone to rebuild the people of Judah, he's gone to establish the kingdom to rebuild the city, reestablish the institutions, and uh, to repopulate the city. He is faced with incredible opposition from without, military threats, and internal opposition and um, difficulties as well. He's facing really difficult challenges. And yet his goal is not only to rebuild the walls, the temple has already been rebuilt. And not only to rebuild the people, they would be like any other people if that was his goal, but was to rebuild a worshiping community. The reason is God uniquely dwells in the worshiping community. Now, in the New Testament, we call that the church. In the Old Testament, it is called uh, the, the people of the covenant. And that is the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, those who have entered into covenant with God the people, in this case, of Judea. And so we see what Nehemiah says. Uh, in this chapter, I'm not going to read the whole chapter, I'm just going to outline it. At the end of this section that I'm going to be discussing, they come to this conclusion. We will not neglect the house of our God. And I want to take a few minutes with you this morning to consider what does that mean. We will not neglect the house of our God. Now, I'm not going to read through uh, the entire passage. I'm going to read the first four verses and then summarize because it's a long passage and there's a lot there. So they've had a month of camp meeting. They've been meeting in the city. They've been dwelling in booths. They've been hearing the word. They've been taught the word. They've been instructed. And at the end of that time, it says, we are going to reestablish our covenant with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We are going to recognize the Mosaic covenant, and we're going to commit to it. And it says, the rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, the temple servants, all who have separated themselves from the peoples of the land to the law of God, their wives, their sons, their daughters, all who have knowledge and understanding. That means their children who had knowledge and understanding. Join with their brothers, their nobles, and enter into a curse and an oath to walk in God's law that was given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe and do all the commandments of the Lord, our Lord, and his rules and his statutes. So here's what they're saying. We've rebuilt the city. We've reestablished. We're reestablishing our institution. We've reestablished our identity as a people. But now the most important thing that we're going to do is to reestablish our practices and our identity as a worshiping community. That defines who we are as the people of Judah. And that's what they are committing themselves to do. Otherwise, they're just another group, another political entity in that part of the world. So in summary, what they commit to do is the following. They commit to no unequal yoke. They say that we will uh, marry within the faith. We will 
make sure that our sons and daughters grow up as followers of you and commit to this most critical relationship to those who trust in the same Lord, God. They say, we commit to no commerce on the Sabbath. For them, the Sabbath was a day where they were to worship. They were to spend it in worship. And the nations around them wanted to continue the commerce. They wanted to have what we have, 24-7 commerce all the time. And they said, no, this is our city, this is our land, and we will sanctify the Sabbath as Moses has commanded us to, and we will not have commerce on the Sabbath. And then they said, here's something that we learned in this month of teaching, that every seventh year we're supposed to release our brothers from their debts. We're supposed to show compassion and mercy and set people free from their indebtedness to us. We will observe that year of release. And then they go on to say, in addition to that, we will contribute financially the offerings to the feasts, the work on the house of God, and the wood for the altar. We will make sure that services are taking place in the temple regularly, and those who are called to serve in the temple will be helped to do so. And the animal sacrifices and the wood for the fire, everything's needed, we will supply. They commit to that. And then they say, the first fruits of the crops, the flocks, the tithe and the tithe of the tithe, that is those who received tithes also gave tithes. We commit to do all of these things. So what we see, oh, I don't want to show you that yet. That's a surprise. That was a teaser, see. What we see is that these people, through this difficulty, the hardships that they have been facing, over these recent months, as they rebuild the city, find themselves in a state where they are coming together to serve the Lord. And the ultimate, the capstone of their serving the Lord, the capstone of their serving the Lord, is to reestablish worship in the house of God. They're united in their faith. When you and I say we're united in our faith, what we're saying is we have the same beliefs. We follow the same Lord. We trust in the same God. We seek to understand the same owner's manual and put those things into practice. It's, it's, it's not an intellectual exercise. It's more than that, but there's an element of we have a united understanding of who our God is and what is required of us. Secondly, they are united in knowledge. They have been in this camp meeting for a month, and they've been hearing all the law of Moses, all that's required with them. That's why they say, we will marry within our faith. We will keep the Sabbath. We will keep the year of release. We will support the offerings and the continual and daily worship at the house of God. They are also united and committed to pursue a holy life. You see, they are committed to sanctification. Sanctification is a New Testament word, but it's something that they say in their commitment, we are committed to doing what God requires of us, what he calls us to do. And it's much larger than what we've just read, much larger. It certainly includes the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, and other things. But we are going to pursue a holy life. And so a holy life is more than just what we believe or what we think. It's how we behave. It's how we carry out our faith. Sanctification in the New Testament is an established fact, but it's also an ongoing process. Paul said to the Corinthians, such were some of you. That is, people who engaged in very sinful practices and pursuits and attitudes. He says, such were some of you in the past tense. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. And what that means is sanctification, being cleansed, being set apart, is an act that takes place within a moment. When the blood of Jesus is applied to your heart and to your conscience, 
when you put your trust in the Lord and he saves your soul and gives you a new spirit. You're set apart. You are sanctified. That's through faith. But sanctification is more than that. Sanctification, and this is one of these truths in tension that the Bible and our faith is full of. We'll look at another one in a moment. The truth in tension is your sanctification is something that has taken place through the blood of Christ. It's also something that is taking place through the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit in your life to make you more like him. Beloved, does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We are now called the children of God, but it does not yet appear what we shall be. We know that we shall be like him. In other words, God has set us apart. He has cleansed us, but his spirit is also at work in us to conform us to his image. And I thank God for that. Because there are things in my heart, in my life, there are things in your heart, in your life, that need to be cleansed, need to be renewed, need to be transformed. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Paul also said, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, because God is at work in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. In other words, that process of sanctification, it is an established fact. It is an ongoing process. Anybody here feel like you need an ongoing process? Five people raise their hands. That is the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. And so these people in Nehemiah's time said, we are going to commit to walk out the law of Moses according to our understanding. They are committed to sanctification. So it's not just an act of faith. It's also faith accompanied by works. Faith without works is dead. You're not saved by your works. You're not even sanctified by your works. But sanctification works itself out through you as you walk in the Spirit. And they were united in their commitment to the house of worship. They are going to pray. They're going to be present. They're going to serve. They're going to support. That's why I'm so delighted with our membership this morning, these commitments. We will pray for you. We will serve. We will be present. We will support what you do. They are committed. We will not neglect the house of our God. We will establish ourselves as a worshiping community because God uniquely lives and dwells within the worshiping community. Now there's, a, there's another paradox. There is the issue of the visible representation of the community of God. And there is the issue of the invisible or personal representation. Now, in the day of, uh, of Nehemiah, the presence of God and the people of God was represented by the temple of God. But it is not the physical temple that is the church, that is the worshiping community. The physical temple is a tool. We thank God for our physical church building. We thank God for the work that's been done on it, for all of the effort that's been made, all the support that's gone into it. But this is a tool. This is a statement of stewardship. The tool is not the worshiping community. It houses the worshiping community when we come together. And other faiths and other ideologies have understood this incompletely. For instance, that's called the Hagia Sophia. That was one of the largest churches in the world. In 1453, the Turkish Muslims went in, conquered the city. The very first thing they did was they turned the church into a mosque because they knew that church was saying, we have a Christmas Christian presence here. 
And the mosque says we have a Muslim presence here. That's what it says. Under Ceausescu, there was a law that you could not build a church building over a certain level. The reason is the presence of a church building says there's Christians here. And everybody knows there's no Christians in Romania, but that was totally false because there was total, total, total revival there. And so there was a group of very enterprising Christians in Timisoara, where our friend Biliana is from, and this is a church she's familiar with. I think her mother was baptized there, who did the following. You see that kind of commonplace building? Looks like a house, doesn't it? Well, if you go, and Al Ceausescu said, you cannot have a church building bigger than a certain level. You can't build any new church buildings. Well, what they did was, that's the Aileen Pentecostal Church, they built, you go in to this little house, and there's a whole other world in there. And it seats 3,000 people behind that little facade. And they are always full all the time. Now here's the paradox. The church isn't the building. The building houses the church and the worshiping community. But it also is a statement of stewardship. It's a statement of presence. But it doesn't matter if you meet in a gym, if you meet in a restaurant, if you meet in a refugee camp. Wherever the worshiping community of God is, that's where God is. However, these things are understood to be significant and important because they do make a statement. They can be part of our witness. But I want to show you what the true church is. Solomon, when he built his temple, said, God will indeed, will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven can't contain you. How much less this house that I have built? Solomon understands that the building, it's, it's a testimony, it's a symbol. But it reflects a much greater reality. Here's what Scripture tells us that the church is made up of living stones. This is our picture before we moved to this building almost 25 years ago. Those people, many of whom represent you, are living stones. That is the church. That's the worshiping community. Whether we meet in the old Jewish synagogue, sanctuary, or whether we meet here, and whether we wave, uh, that's a greeting that we wave when I was on a mission trip to uh, Croatia. You wave from, you are the living stones. You are the people of God. Amen. God dwells in and works uniquely in you. God dwells in and works uniquely through his church. We are grateful for all the stuff and we will not neglect the stewardship of the house of God. Most importantly, we'll not neglect the people of God. And here's how it's put. You have come to him, that is to Christ, a living stone rejected by men in the sight of God, chosen and precious. You yourselves are like living stones being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And then further, we are told this. You are fellow citizens with the saints, members of the household of God, built on the foundations of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom this whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. You are built together, growing into a holy temple temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So when we say we will not neglect the house of our God, everything we do 
is to further the purpose of the effectiveness and the grace resting upon the worshiping community. So some of you say, I worship God by myself. I want you to understand God dwells uniquely in his church. While he dwells in our hearts, he dwells in us collectively. We're grateful for Zoom Church over these months. And I thank God that we can reach people through Zoom Church. But there's something about being together personally, together in fellowship, flesh and blood. I was reading a blog post recently. It says this is the difference. It was on the Evangelical Free Church website. Here's the difference. There was a reality show where they were setting up a Zoom meeting with a family and their father who was over in Iraq and they were going to show them on the Zoom meeting. But what they had arranged was that the father was on leave and while they were setting up the Zoom meeting, he would walk through the door and their whole response was different than it would have been on a Zoom meeting. I want to say to you, there's something about being there in person. The online is great and we reach many people but our presence together is crucial. Some of you are struggling. I want to encourage you to get in the mix. Do not isolate. God will help you in spite of your struggles. Some of you say, I'm not good enough. If you only knew I am not good enough. Others say, these are all broken people. I'm too good. Not really. So the question is, where is God? He says, I will be your God and you shall be my people. I will dwell among you. You are where God uniquely dwells if you are in Christ. I want you to stand with me. you to open your hands to the Lord. You have been given gifts. You've been given abilities. You've given a contribution to make. I want to challenge you today to open your hands and to say, Lord, draw near to me that I may know how you would use me, that the gift you have given may be awakened and become useful, that I would not neglect the house of my God. I want to challenge you, wherever you are, to lift your hands to the Lord, if that is your desire. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit will fall upon your church, that you'll do a fresh work, a new work in the hearts and minds of our people. Lord, that there'll be new opportunities, new direction, new ways opening up. Thank you, Father, that you would clothe the people of God with the presence of God, that they would know that they collectively are where you uniquely dwell. They would experience daily, and they would experience it in fellowship together. In Christ's name, amen. Amen.